In our last episode, we mentioned that ancient Maya traders took to the sea in massive dugout canoes. On his fourth voyage to the Americas, Columbus encountered a canoe off the coast of Honduras, which may have hailed from Yucatan. On board were some 25 paddlers and passengers. The boat was said to be 8 feet wide, 50 feet long, and filled with cargo. In 1517, Hernandez de Córdoba was met by 10 canoes shortly before making the first European landfall on the Yucatan Peninsula. These were most certainly dugout canoes, each fashioned from a single tree, and it's fair to say that they were substantial watercraft. However, it's difficult to rely on early European accounts with respect to the size and scale and the kinds of details we'd like to learn more about. We have seen depictions of canoes in Maya art and iconography, like the incised bone from Tikal or the rain god Chalk paddling across the pages of the Dresden Codex. Pre-Columbian sculptures or models include a carved manatee bone from Moho Key in Belize and a jade canoe from the Olmec heartland of the Gulf Coast. A rare scene is found on the walls of the Upper Temple of the Warriors at Chichen Itza, where a mural shows canoe-borne soldiers ominously surveying a coastal community. The codices and art objects do provide a view into the connections between gods and the watery realms they inhabit or traverse. But even pictorial scenes like the one at Chichen Itza cannot be relied upon as being representational of the form and function of Maya seagoing canoes. During the time of the post-classic Maya, there were hundreds, perhaps thousands of canoes plying the shores and intercoastal waterways of the Yucatan Peninsula. So where are these canoes today? Though the rocky, saltwater lagoons along the Caribbean coast of the peninsula are known to have served as bustling ports, teredos, or shipworms, and the ravages of time appear to have removed any and all evidence of the elusive Maya seagoing canoe. Perhaps the most exciting discovery so far was made by Heather McKillop and her team in southern Belize. Partially buried on the bottom of a lagoon was a well-preserved ancient Maya canoe paddle. Its shape and form were consistent with the asymmetrical paddles depicted in Maya art. This paddle offers us a rare glimpse into Maya nautical gear and gives us hope that intact canoes still remain hidden beneath the silt. Two of the oldest dugout canoes yet found in the Americas were discovered in De Leon Spring, Florida, dating to nearly 7,000 years ago. Some 400 pre-Columbian dugout canoes have been found in Florida. Crafted from pine or cypress, the longest reach 40 feet. The Timucua peoples, for example, were master canoe builders and possessed an intimate knowledge of the complex riverine, lake, and coastal ecosystems of North Florida. With respect to the inland reaches of the Yucatan, the peninsula's few freshwater lakes, like those at Coba, do hold promise of preserving these more modest watercraft, which were intended for protected waters. The most amazing discovery was recently made in a cenote, or freshwater sinkhole, not far from Chichen Itza. A dugout canoe resting on the bottom of a flooded cave. Elena Barba and colleagues from Mexico's Subdirectorate of Underwater Archaeology are documenting this unique find. Was it an offering, or perhaps the small canoe once occupied by a ceremonial paddler? drifting into the subterranean world of the rain gods. But what of seafaring Maya? The builders, paddlers, and navigators of robust watercraft capable of braving the most treacherous waters of the Yucatan's east coast, moving precious cargo from port to port. In the mid-1970s, Arthur Miller, Nancy Ferris, and Pilar Luna were clever in turning their attention toward the silty freshwater coastal lakes of Chunyash Che, which, through a series of ancient canals, connected intercoastal sites to the sea. Despite their use of sub-bottom profiling sonar, no preserved canoes were found during their underwater survey. At the ancient Maya port of Vista Alegre to the north, Jeffrey Glover and I have identified what we believe to be an ideal location to continue this search. Clearly delineated, shallow, brackish harbors where the depositional conditions appear to have been favorable for the preservation of organic materials. Indeed, the bottoms of harbors are where watercraft either derelict or abandoned, or swamped at the dock by storms, often wind up. Here we have muelles or stone keys that extend into the lagoon, no doubt once serving the many canoes that called upon Vista Alegre. The docks are a continuation of a wall that extends across the southern portion of the site. Was this feature defensive? Given the concentration of wealth at the port site, one can imagine that piracy was a constant threat. 
As we continue our program of research and exploration along the northeast coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, along with our colleagues Roy Kakel, Beverly Goodman, Trish Beddoes, and Derek Smith, we find ourselves in a unique position to integrate Vista Alegre into larger studies concerning regional economic and political organization. A more detailed understanding of this strategic ancient port will enable us to not only evaluate the linkages between the coastal and inland sites within the region, but also determine the role of Vista Alegre within the context of post-classic circumpeninsular trade and interaction. Today, along the forest-shrouded shores, the lakes and rivers of Chiapas, Lacandon Maya canoe builders keep the dugout tradition alive. Alberto Soto Villopondo has documented and shared their mastery through film, while we learn the many layers of human knowledge and spiritual meaning embodied by this seemingly simple but noble watercraft. Back on the east coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, a different sort of tradition has emerged. Since 2006, hundreds of intrepid paddlers have been recreating the canoe crossing to Isla Cozumel. Setting off from Xcaret, or ancient Pole, they endure currents and wind swell for up to 30 kilometers. This journey of five hours in ideal conditions takes them to one of the most important Maya centers of pilgrimage and commerce. The island of Cozumel occupied the easternmost frontier of the Maya world, the birthplace of the sun. After honoring the goddess Ishel, the paddlers return to the mainland, coming ashore at Shamanha, or present-day Playa del Carmen. Such a cultural revitalization effort can be viewed from many perspectives, though immediately appreciated by all is the arduous nature of such an enterprise. Taking to the sea in canoes, no matter how grand the vessel was fraught, requiring equal measures of skill, tenacity, and courage. In our final episode on the Maritime Maya, we'll explore how coastal trade and interaction reshaped the Maya world.